Welcome. You're listening to Women's Health and Beyond with Dr. David Goslin, the only podcast for women providing a physician's point of view on everything relating to women's health, sexual medicine, and cosmetic gynecology. Get ready to discover the latest and hottest topics in women's health and how they relate to you. Welcome, everyone. I'm so excited today because it is not very often that one gets to have a one-on-one -on -one dialogue with a mentor that has literally changed their lives. So today's guest is somebody who's world-renowned, has been a pioneer, a leader in so many areas of women's health, sexual medicine, and somebody who I don't even think he realizes how much he changed the course of my career. And I'll give him a quick little flashback. In 2005, I had just graduated residency, moved to Los Angeles, opened my own solo practice in a strip mall, had very few patients. And at that time, there was a little bit of a buzz going around about this vaginal rejuvenation stuff. And I started Googling it, and there were two people doing it at the time that I remember. One was Dr. Red Allensot, who's our guest today, and one was David Madlock, who's also a friend. So I spoke with both of them, and there was something about Red that really caught me. And when he spoke to me, he actually took the time to drive all the way down from Laguna Beach to Los Angeles. I was right next to Cedar sinai I remember he had a 5 Series BMW, <laughs> and he pulled up at the coffee bean, and we had coffee outside. And it wasn't the surgery itself that inspired me. It was his passion. And, and just hearing him talk about how he was changing women's health and sexual medicine inspired me to really take on a different curve in my career. And I've never looked back and it's changed my career. And I am always indebted to you because you are truly a teacher. And, and that's something to be very proud of and a legacy. So I'm honored to welcome Dr. Red Allen Saw to my show, Women's Health and Beyond. Welcome, Red. Well, thank you so much, David. That was a very kind intro. I really appreciate it. I do remember that time when I drove up and met you at that uh, uh, coffee place. I remember it like it was yesterday. I can't believe it's been that long. Can you believe it? I can't believe it either. Well, look, you know, my audience wants to know about how somebody starts a vision like you have, because really it's not an easy vision. It's a difficult space. Even today, it's still a difficult space to sort of find your niche. And back in 2005, it was really almost taboo. And I know you've experienced it. I've experienced it. So we're, I just want to know what inspired you and, and tell me about the journey. Well, you know, it's been a, a sideways journey with lots of turns. I was initially going to be uh, an academic surgeon. I wanted to be a gynecologic oncologist and I actually... Um, uh, put my career in that path. I, I got a fellowship at Yale to be a gynecologic oncologist. Was, this was 1990, but during that time, it was uh, the time of uh, strife in our country. We had the Gulf War and all that. And so um, after I got accepted for a position to be a female cancer specialist doing pelvic reconstructive surgery, um, I got pulled out of the um, uh, starting that position, and I actually had to go and do my payback for the Air Force during that time. They sponsored, they gave me a scholarship and sponsored my medical school. So instead of going to academic medicine and being a gynecologic oncologist and doing all these intense surgeries, uh, which I intended to do as my, my career, God had another plan for me. He says, nope, you're going to be an Air Force doc. You're going to do your time. And guess what? I have something else for you take a look at this thing. And so he showed me, uh, I learned a lot more of the benign um, surgeries, The because uh, really my, my passion was pelvic reconstruction, fixing fallen bladders, fallen rectums. I had a lot of ideas in my head on how to make that better. And so my career um, for the next decade became pelvic reconstruction. Um, I, I left the military and didn't go back to a fellowship because I, I loved doing the benign surgery so much that um, I completely changed careers. And so I worked for a group in LA out there um, where you're at, you're, you are. I was in Northridge for a decade and I was a gynecologist doing mostly um, 
a pelvic reconstructive surgery. I had two to three days of surgery per week, but I had to take OB call. And so that was kind of brutal doing surgeries uh, and then taking OB call. And so um, I did notice that when I was doing cancer surgeries, we would do these big um, uh, reconstructions for cancer of the vulva. And when we would do those type of surgeries, our whole goal was to change to save the patient's life. These were life-threatening issues. And so we didn't do them very pretty. <laughs> we would do these exoneration, vulvectomies, and um, the whole goal of an uh, oncologist at that time was for uh, making sure the patient lives, survives, and is functional. But we really didn't care about how things look. And so I started thinking of how to modify some of those cancer surgeries so that it could be beautiful. Uh, and functional at the same time. And so over the past, in, in that first decade I was in private practice, that's kind of what I, I was thinking about. I started doing these surgeries when I was in the military and the Air Force in 1990, and I kept doing them till about 2004. And then in 2004, I had this opportunity um, and I was recruited uh, by uh, a hospital in Laguna Beach, South Coast Medical Center. They said, we need a pelvic surgeon, a, your gynecologist, um, and I hear you're doing cosmetic surgeries too. Would you like to, would you be able to move from LA to Orange County? And so my wife and I thought about it for about a nanosecond and we moved. Totally. And yes. And then, um, so after we moved in 2004, uh, we started um, doing the surgeries I really liked and I stopped obstetrics in 2005 and built my teaching program because I had been teaching it. Um, teaching this stuff in LA, but mostly the pelvic reconstruction, you know, um, the, the deep, intense pelvic surgeries. And now I could teach that here in Laguna Beach, but also teach the cosmetic stuff that I had a passion for. And so I developed my teaching program here. I started in 2005, and that's around the time that I saw you. You were one of the very, very first doctors that, that showed an interest and actually came out to Laguna Beach and trained eventually and so that's my career path. I wanted to make something that was um, uh, uh, a functional repair into a functional repair that was beautiful. So I wanted to combine both aspects. And so that's how, that's how I came into this path uh, in my career. And then the training part of it just grew over the next 15 years. I mean, you know what's most amazing and admirable about you, Red, is that you're evolving all the time. And then... Mm -hmm. You know, when I first came out in 2005, you were novel in the way you were approaching labioplasties. We had never seen those surgical approaches, which I'm still at awe at how you even thought about them. You were using an instrument called an Elman Surgitron, which today is, is pretty much standard of care when you're doing labioplasties, and that's what most of us use. But even the way you administer local anesthesia, I mean, you, you, you've, you've looked at everything from instruments to local anesthesia to technique, and that's always changing. I mean, I know that you're offering this fellowship course right now that I've been watching in the mornings. And even 15 years later, I'm sitting there going, how did he even think about putting a needle right there? I didn't even think about that. And, and even today, I've been doing so many labioplasties, thanks to you. I, because of you, have changed so much. And, and and so how, what goes through your head? I mean, do you wake up in the middle of the night and have these visions? I mean, is this what you dream about? I mean, that's, I think maybe you're so passionate about it. Yeah, it's pretty weird, but you're exactly right. I have a little, I used to have a pad um, um, uh, in my, a writing pad by my desk. And I would wake, wake up at three or four in the morning and I'd write those ideas down. It's true. But now I have an iPad beside <laughs> my, my uh, bed. And when I wake up, my wife thinks I'm, I'm a nut for doing this but you know um my ideas come in the middle of a sleep or a dream and i go hey that's kind of a cool idea why don't we try that and so yeah you have it exactly right um that's funny you wake up at three or four in the morning and write these ideas down but actually my goal my goal when i started my my career was uh, i wanted everything i touch to be something i developed that was actually a goal i had and so um, when I'm doing surgeries, I'm always thinking, ah, this is such a unnecessary step or this is not efficient. And so I'm always thinking 
how can I, I cut a step, make it more efficient, make it quicker, but better. And so, um, for example, when you're doing surgery, you know, with me and you, when we're doing surgeries, our hands up are in the air and our elbows and shoulders get tired. Um, and, and so one of the earliest inventions I had was this table just to make my life easier. I didn't care about any other surgeon, but just to make my life easier, a table to rest my arms so that I can do surgeries all day without getting fatigued. And I got a patent on that and uh, was in the market for several years. And then another thing that frustrated me was the retractor systems that we had early on in our careers, gynecologic surgery. We're working like in small areas. It's like doing a tune up to a tailpipe. You've heard that statement. Yes. So we can't see what we're doing. And so that really frustrated me for, for decades. And finally, uh, I was able to design a system and you know about it, the Lone Star Retractor. I was able to get that out. And now it's 13 years later, my patent's gonna expire next year and everyone's gonna copy it. But, uh, and, um, those Everyone's the, using it now. I know. I still use it now. It's the most used vaginal retractor um, in the world. And, but things like that, even scissors, scissors that I, I didn't like the scissors I was using. So I designed the set. And now, now I slowly was able to achieve the, the goal of anything I use during surgery. I either developed or had a hand in because I wanted to be just as precise as possible that would fit my style. And that's why I was able to develop it for the years. I had one, one massive failure though. I designed um, a drape system, a draping system that I was never able to get um, a patent on. I worked seven years to get that patent and the patent agency would never give it to me. They said it wasn't novel enough. So I've had my success, my share of uh, successes and failures too. Well, that, that's what defines a leader. Um, Red, let me ask you another question. So we all do labioplasties, but you're, to be honest, well known for a, t a very particular type of labioplasty called the Barbie look. Oh, yes. And, and when, when you hear Barbie look and you do cosmetic gynecology for a living, that that in, is parallel or anonymous with Dr. Red Allen saw. And, and so when somebody brings it up, you know that they have read something or gone to your, their, your website. How did you even, I mean, was this patient inspired? I mean, what yep. made you describe the Barbie look and, and, and how it came about and what you think of it today? It's a very controversial um, procedure and technique, and it's not for everybody. It's um, a procedure. For those of you who don't know, uh, a Barbie look labioplasty is a labioplasty that's pretty much the most extreme you can do where you remove all or almost all of the labia minora. And it's not for everyone. It doesn't look good on everyone, but there are subsets of patients where it looks just absolutely beautiful. And how it started off was when I was in my Los Angeles practice, I, I worked in Northridge and um, up in Mission Hills, up in the North Valley. And the um, adult entertainment industry and the um, uh, movie industry were, a, a lot of them were in Chatsworth uh, in, the, in the North San Fernando Valley of Los Angeles. And so in my group, we had the contract with one adult entertainment um, filmmaking agency, and they had to have um, their, their uh, um, gonorrhea and chlamydia cultures, all their cultures, all their blood work every month. And guess who got to do them? I was, I was volunteered to, to take care of those patients. I don't know if that's a blessing or-, or No, it was a blessing. <laughs> it, it was a blessing because these were- these, Sure, these, of course. Uh, patients were very kind patients. Um, and uh, it, was, it was fun to- uh, taking care of them because all oh, the stories that you hear are amazing. Yes. And so one of them came to my office one day, um, you know, this is 20 years ago, um, and, and said to me, I want to look like Barbie. And I said, Barbie, uh, what does that mean? He says, I don't want anything down there. It's all floppy. My, my lady are sticking out, pulling, um, tugging on my clothing. Can't you just make it a little fine line like a uh, like a coin slot. And, and I said to her, Barbie, you want to look like Barbie? I said, Barbie doesn't have a labia. And she said to me, exactly. And so that gave me an idea in my head on how to design something where uh, I'd seen enough patients in my career that patients had big labia or no labia. And a lot, most patients are in between. And the ones with the no labia look, they're just born with it. They only have a majora and a very little minora. And 
I thought, well, that could be an option. There's a wide range of normals. Why, why can't that be uh, 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 maybe the extreme of, of normal, but still a normal? So I started designing and thinking about doing um, that labioplasty. And over the years, I learned who, who it's best for and who to avoid for, for doing the Barbie labioplasty. Um, I must say, um, I've had Olympic athletes, uh, athletes in, a, in an upper echelon level who want the most comfort and who don't wanna think about pulling or tugging or adjusting like a baseball player. You know, you see them on TV always adjusting their, their crotch area. Well, that happens to women too. And on these elite athletes, they don't have to do that when they're the, on the Olympic stage, uh, per se. And so I started doing that and patients just love the comfort. And um, most patients were exceptionally happy with it. I did have a few that have regrets and wish they had um, some left. So for those patients, I had to develop on how to create the illusion of having a labia, although their labia wasn't there uh, anymore. So. Um, I, I knew that this would potentially be a, a big thing uh, marketing wise, because you know, every, um, I, I, either I, I would um, name it something else, but everyone called it a Barbie look and I didn't want to get sued by Mattel. Um, so I didn't that's want to funny. call it Barbie, Barbie doll look or anything. So I just said, well, Barbie look, baby plastic, if that's what you guys want to call it. Okay. And so I was, um, I took a vacation and, and landed in Honolulu uh, in Hawaii. And then, oh, actually, with Maui, we landed on the um, in the airport, and immediately I got a buzzing in my phone, and I answered it, and it was um, one of the magazines in New York. I'm not sure; I can't remember if it was Variety magazine or one of those, The New Yorker or Variety, one of those. And this was, you know, 2005, 2006, and um, they started asking me, "What, you know, what is this Barbie uh, Barbie look, lady plastic?" And from then on, it spread worldwide. And it that amazing. Other, yeah, other magazines. And I can remember my first interview at the airport, <laughs> 15 minutes on the phone with the, the New Yorker, or, or I can't remember which magazine it was exactly. As, as your kids are, pl are pulling on you to hurry up. Yeah, yeah we're all, we were all waiting in the baggage claim area. You know, our bags are, are floating around and I'm, I'm talking to them. You know, my wife is exceptionally irritated at me. He says, you can, we're on vacation, you know. Well, you know, you know, I'll tell you something, Red, and you and I briefly had a discussion about this right before this podcast. When I first started, there was very little internet, just like you. And so we didn't have the option to really truly market the way we can market today and bring awareness to the world as we do today. But it's amazing to me, the awareness that has arisen over the years in regards to cosmetic gynecology. It is one of the fastest growing areas of plastic surgery, really. And something that is revolutionizing the way people look are looking at themselves. And so tell me a little bit about why you think that is and where do you see the future of this going? Is this a momentum that's gonna continue? Is this just a fad? What do you think? Well, we all, everyone thought it was just a fad when we started doing this in the mid to late nineties. Um, I'm sure you got a lot of blowback I sure got a lot of blowback from my colleagues when I was there in the San Fernando Valley and my academic colleagues, remember my career was going to be in academia, but um, I changed my career, but my academic colleagues uh, were all asking, Red, what the heck are you doing? You know, this is going to ruin your reputation. <laughs> and and um, I said, no, there's, an, there's a need for this and you guys can laugh all you want, but there's a need for it and patients are are searching out doctors who can help them achieve um, their needs. So there was a need that wasn't being met. There was a demand that patients had that my peers were, were poo-pooing. Um, they were just saying, that's part of normal, live with it. It would be like having a crooked nose, a bashed in nose, or breasts that were massively distorted and, and, and doctors telling them, that's part of normal, just live with it. And for these patients, it was a quality of life. It was their, their um, self-worth that was at stake, their, their confidence, their ability to become intimate with, with their partners. It was uh, greatly affected by these issues that were, that were genital and no one wanted to deal with it. The gynecologists didn't want to deal with it. They, they, they're saying that it's normal, just live with it. You know, insurance won't pay for it. You know, if I do a three-hour surgery, insurance will only pay me $380. I'm not going to do it. 
And so um, I thought, well, you know, if, if, if there was someone that was able to meet these needs, um, this should be developed. And the first guy, as you know, uh, uh, is Dr. Matlock, who took all the, the, the bullets and the arrows in his back when he first started doing this. And he was meeting a certain need in the community. It was controversial, but anyone who starts anything new, is, it, it will be controversial. There's no way around it. And you just have to basically take those arrows and bullets. And, you know, you think of your patients first. What, how can you help them? How can you help them um, uh, fulfill, fulfill, fulfill and meet their needs in a safe manner? It could be controversial because no one's done it before. But guess what? You get to, to do the dreaming. You get to um, uh, set the, the trends, not just trends, but um, help these patients. You give them hope. And, and they, won't, they won't stop thanking you for the rest of their lives for the, the change that you've made in their lives. And so that was the most rewarding thing. And then once you do that, you get this passion. Boy, how can I teach other doctors? Because this is amazing. I'm in one corner of the world here in California and um, there's a demand worldwide. I, I, you know, those were the days where I got so many emails and letters and how do I do this? How do I do this? And so we started our yearly meetings back in 2006 or so. And you came to a few of those, those yep. CAPS meeting, those uh, Congress on Aesthetic Vaginal Surgery. Those are the first um, uh, national air national meetings to come around. And now they're everywhere around the world. Every country has their, their own meeting um, because we have shown that this is a specialty that's here to stay, that it's meeting needs. It's We're not minimizing the the complaints of patients, we're listening to them, and you know what, we, we can do something to help them. And, and I'm hoping that our own specialty, GYN and plastics, cosmetics will have formal training in the future. I think it will. I think both you and I will become um, part of a bigger niche in the future, uh, but it, it'll still be slow. It'll be another decade or so before academic programs will include this. True, Red. So you know, for all of us who do cosmetic gynecology and speaking particularly to surgery, I just want to remind the audience who are mostly patients out there, the importance of experience when you're doing these surgeries. I can't tell you that there really is truly a learning curve. It's, if it's not something that you're doing all the time in your practice, you need to find a, a surgeon who does because it really makes a huge difference. Um, like Red said in the beginning, all of us, as we're doing surgery, we're constantly updating and, and perfecting our craft. But it's not just surgery anymore. Cosmetic gynecology means so much more to you and I, Red. You know, now we've dealt into how do we help women in their sexual intimacy and comfort level and beyond surgery. And you've done some radical changes in that area. I mean, as the one of the inventors of Thermiva radio frequency, Tell us about outside of the techniques you invented surgically, what have you done to improve function and quality of intimacy for women? Well, it, first you have to acknowledge that there is a problem and, and um, most of us in our training never had any training in sexual medicine. I didn't get any, did you get any? Me neither, none. None of us. Just high school and college. And so, yeah, just high school and college. <laughs> And so you, you had to first find an interest in it and be able to talk about it freely without embarrassment. You have to learn how to talk to patients. They're, they're, you're, you're their guy and they come in. Absolutely. Talk to you. And um, what made it easier for me was to, to have my initial intake form, which you have, um, uh, you know, that specifically asked intimate personal uh, questions without embarrassment. It's in my questionnaire there. Are you having pain with intercourse? Um, are you having enough moisture? Are you uh, suffering from um, uh, discomfort from pulling and tugging and, and things like that, things that we don't usually are trained to, to ask patients. And so having that in our intake form and then being free to talk to the patient, it, I think it's just a, a huge thing. So over the years, I've learned that not everyone wants surgery, right? Not everyone can afford surgery. Um, and some of the problems are not bad enough to, to do surgery on, but they're still wanting an improvement. For example, let's, let's pick something like um, 
a leaky bladder or reduced sensitivity. Those are some of my everyday problems that I take care of. So with a, with a leaky bladder, with a patient that wakes up milk, um, five, six times at night or pees 20 times a day, uh, or even leaks urine when they, they cough, sneeze, and jump, can't be on a trampoline. These are the patients that I see <clears throat> every day who, who want something to help them, but not necessarily surgery. They're, they, they're afraid of surgery. They can't afford surgery. What can, what can they, they don't have downtime um, to, to recover. And so I, I started going to, you know, um, plastic surgery meetings, uh, laser meetings, um, cosmetic surgery meetings around the world. And I saw that faces, necks, tummies were treated with technologies to, to shrink skin. So one day, one night at 4 a.m., <laughs> I, I thought, you know, something simple. I said, well, I shrink skin on the face all the time and on the neck. Why can't I shrink the skin in the vagina? It's the same stuff. Why can't I shrink skin on the, the labia majora or the vulva? It's the same stuff. It's safe to use around the eyes. We treat around the eyes all the time and it doesn't make people blind. It doesn't damage nerves. Sure. And, and, and the, the vagina and vulva tissues are tough. They take a lot of abuse and beating per se. And, and so I, I, um, I started looking for devices that can help women. You know, at, at this time, the only thing that could be used were lasers. Remember, um, uh, the first company came to the U.S. with a laser for the vaginal use was Fatona. And I yeah. became good friends with their CEO. And I, in, I invited them to my first meetings and I got to know them well. And so I thought, this is great technology. And Adrian Gaspar, which you know, was, was came to my meeting. He flew from Argentina and spoke about it and presented it and introduced it to the United States at that time. And I thought, oh, this is fantastic. Uh, there's got to be other technologies out there. So while he was working with lasers, I was able to find a company who gave me or let me use a radio frequency device. The radio frequency device is something that produces heat and shrinks tissues. Uh, it's usually used in the face and neck. But when I started using it in the vulva and vagina, it was just like mind blowing to me because I saw it tighten the vulva and I saw it, saw it tighten the vagina, but we didn't have a, a, a handpiece to treat deep inside the vagina. So I spent uh, about a year designing it, designing a handpiece for the vagina. This was back in 2009. So a long time ago, 2009. But not and, that long ago. Yeah, that's true. 2009. And then um, I actually designed it and I actually had the CEO of the company, CEO of Elman at that time. It was Elman. Wow. Yeah. We had a handshake right here in my office. I'm looking, I'm sitting in my office right now. I remember him here. And, and so we were going to develop it, get it out by 2010. Can you believe it? Way wow. Um, and this is a great history. But instead of moving forward with my project, it was a handshake project. I didn't have a contract yet. Um, they changed course and they bought a laser company instead. So they thought, well, let's buy a laser company instead of working on on this radio frequency device. And if you know, Elman is a radio frequency company, so they completely changed focus. And unfortunately that venture of theirs failed so badly that they had to sell their company or it, it was acquired by a company called Sinusure. And my project went away. Nothing happened for, from 2009 till about 2013. Oh, I where, didn't know that. Yeah, for, so it went nowhere sideways for all these years, but I had their device, the radio frequency device, so I accumulated three, four years of data. I kept doing vulva and as deep as I can in the vagina. And I showed um, that it was safe to do. We had no adverse events, um, uh, an occasional urine infection, very rare, but no blisters, no burns. The patient had um, uh, less leakage, it had tighter vulva. And so in 2013, now probably you were, you were probably at that meeting in 2013, at one of my meetings, there was a guy sitting in the back of the room. His name was, his name was Paul Hirschman, and he heard me talk. And he had just bought a, uh, a radio frequency device uh, or patents. And his company was called Thermigen. Thermigen. And so after the meeting, he came up to me. This was 2013. He said, hey, Red, we just have this new technology called radio frequency. Uh, would you have an interest in working with us? 
And I said, oh, I know a little bit about radio frequency. And, and he said to me, um, uh, would you be willing to design a vaginal probe for us for treatment for, for um, at the term, the term was vaginal rejuvenation, remember? We, were, we all used yes. that term. And so I said to him, hmm, you want me to design a vaginal probe? And I said to him, I did it four years ago. I have data. And um, that's something. Uh, yeah. And I said, okay. So we designed it in 2014. By 2015, it was FDA approved. And so I had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cases showing safety. We got that thing approved in one year. Uh, name another device that gets it through FDA in a year. That's we unbelievable. Saved, yeah. We saved the company, uh, you know, a billion dollars. It takes about a billion dollars to, to get a device from idea to actual market. So we saved them about a billion dollars. We were able to launch in 2015 uh, Thermiva, and um, it's it's done well worldwide. It's um, uh, our industry has been able to help a lot of women with both lasers and radio frequency in helping with the overactive bladder patient. Patient that feels like they have to pee every hour. The patient who leaks when they cough, sneeze, and jump, and then. The most remarkable thing, this is, this is honestly the most amazing thing that came about from this whole experience was I was able to get a group of dermatologists in La Jolla, California um, to, to help me. And they were able to do a study. I designed the study and then they published it where they would biopsy these patients before and after treatments, okay? Before and after the radiofrequency treatments. And so they did the study for about a year and they were able to show that with the radio frequency treatments at the specific um, uh, kilohertz that we both use, um, uh, it showed that there was an increase in the density of the small nerve fibers. Okay, with the increase in the density of the small nerve fibers, a lot of our patients who were either anorgasmic, unable to have orgasms, or were slow to orgasms, were able to retain or get back the sensitivity that they had lost with the aging process. And so I, I, uh, I did a study and we were able to show, it was only a small study, it was 25 patients, but it's become a landmark study. And now I have 80,000 reads on it. Um, it's uh, in the Journal of Laser Surgery and Medicine on the use of radio frequency for, for those patients with orgasmic disorder. So this is the most remarkable thing because I we um, started using this for tightening skin. That's it, tightening skin. And now we can see that it helps with moisture, um, uh, uh, reduce painful intercourse, and help with the sensitivity issues. So this one little device was able to help women all around the world. Now we're in about 42 countries now, um, and over probably 150, close to 200,000 treatments. I'm guessing uh, it was about 150,000 last year. And uh, the safety has been shown to be exceptional on these treatments. Uh, you, you've done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them, and I've done many too. And it's still the core pr um, procedure I have in my office to help women safely. The thing yes. is, it's, it's, so, it's so safe and uh, comfortable for the patient with zero downtime. And so that's been really fantastic for my patients to improve their quality of lives. So, Red, you know, this is really becoming an interesting talk because we started off as really watching you from scratch creating these surgical techniques to improve aesthetic appearance, not functionality. I mean, functionality on one level, but with pooling and tugging of the labias, but really all about aesthetic and confidence and empowerment of how you feel in the bedroom to now developing a laser that not just helps with um, leaky bladder, like you mentioned, um, improvement in, in blood flow to the areas, um, sensation, and even mild tightening. But now I, I want to get into the next chapter, which is now you keep taking it to the next level. So now we've, we've improved the appearance. Now we're starting to improve functionality. What's the next frontier? The next frontier seems to be that how do you really now get to the point where you're really enjoying intimacy in the bedroom and, and overall recovery from these procedures? And that's where I think, again, Red, you're taking it to the next level, which is you're doing some creative, creative treatments that I actually am going to come out and, and learn with you. We've all been doing a lot of PRP, and I know you were an early adopter of PRP, Playlet Rich Plasma, 
I use it, Dr. Runnels introduced it with the O-Shot, P-Shot, been phenomenal. But you're now doing something a little bit more cutting edge than that, and you're using amnion tissue. So I want to know a little bit about how you're improving now and really focusing a lot on sensation, orgasm, and all the good stuff. All the icing on the cake. Yes. Um, so I am using amniotic fluid, but um, the original idea came from my friend in, in Cairo, Egypt, uh, Amir Saif Eldin. I just reached out to him, by the way. Yeah, so great guy. Like different talk. Yeah, great guy. He was the one that showed me that he was recreating um, pelvises, neo-vaginas, and like that with amniotic membrane because it had um, uh, uh, the immunity issues that you know patients didn't reject it, and it had a lot of growth factors, and it had cytokines, which are anti-inflammatory agents. And so when he came and gave a talk in one of my meetings, um, not quite a decade ago, but a long time ago, I got fascinated with amniotic fluid and amnion. And so in, in 2010, I actually started using amniotic fluid that early, but it was so darn expensive. Like um, I think one CC was almost $2,500. And so I found no patients who were willing to actually sure. use it. Um, I used it for post-op healing and it sped up healing by a third. I knew it would speed up healing, but it was too expensive. So um, for almost uh, eight, nine years, I, I didn't get any takers on it until the price of it went down. So instead of um, uh, one CC being about 1800 to $2,500, the price on one CC went down to approximately $400. It was more uh, price uh, effective. And so I knew it was helping tissues heal. It had a lot of growth factors. It was exceptionally safe, no known infections. Um, it was used in orthopedic surgery. It was used actually in, as an inhaled product for patients with um, bad lungs. It reduced the inflammation. And so I thought, okay, overactive bladder is a problem where the bladder is, is the bladder nerves are really irritated from, from some reason. There could be reason from the spine disease or foods that they eat, something that trigger bladder spasms. And so I thought, why don't we, uh, why don't we try using this to reduce the inflammatory effects on the bladder? But how do you do that? You have to go to the OR and inject it like Botox. And I said, no, I know, I'm a surgeon. I know where the bladder is. I know where the mid urethra is. I know where the, the trigone of the bladder is. I can just inject it through the vagina. And um, I, I thought, well, Dr. Reynolds came up with the O shot. And why don't we do an O shot with um, amniotic fluid to augment the PRP? So my first, my first ones were actually using Dr. Reynolds' um, uh, te technique with the O shot. And I just added amniotic fluid to the patient's own um, blood product. And I injected it into the mid urethra. And my goodness, the response in the reduction of overactive bladder was better than any medications out there, any anticholinergics. It was as good, if not better than Merbetrix. And it was a single- well, No effect. side effects. No side effects, exceptionally safe. And one little two minute injection that they cannot feel. It's painful. How long does it last? Uh, it lasts about six to 12 months. I have patients where it's lasting a whole year. I saw a patient, uh, yesterday, who I injected last February, and she's, she was there for her touch-up. It lasted her a good year, but there are for those with severe issues, um, it, averages, it averages about six months to a year. But now, um, not everybody has uh, ability to, to draw blood. Not everyone has nurses to draw blood and spin the blood for PRP. And so now, you can just use amniotic fluid all by itself. The 1cc you mix with um, some saline and then you inject it into the mid urethra, just like you would do the O-shot. Everyone knows, all these gynecologists, you and me know how to do these O-shot. You just either replace the PRP with the amniotic fluid or you augment the um, PRP with the amniotic fluid and you inject it. And it works tremendous for overactive bladder. There are some that it doesn't work good for, those with severe um, interstitial cystitis, not as well, but they still get a relief of symptoms. Amazing. You know, part of the take home message with all this is not, you know, we all, you're such a visionary and inventor, but you also use a lot of hybrid techniques, which is what I like to do. Oh, yeah. Which is taking, 
you know, look, you're the inventor of radio frequency, but there's some great lasers that use fractional CO2, for example. Mm -hmm. What I've been doing for a long time at times is actually mixing the, the energies together. Um, or, you know, somebody comes in for a vaginal tightening surgery, but they have a leaky bladder, but they've heard bad things about the mesh. Maybe they're a little uncomfortable about it. And so we always combine PRP, lasers, and surgery together to really achieve maximum optimization of the results. Um, so I think this is why this field is so amazing for, for outside the box thinkers like us. Um, I, I told you I want to share some procedures that I just published actually on, on a Bartholin procedure that is that I have patients flying in from all over the world right now. Um, that I need you to show me how to put together a teaching program for it, because I really think it's going to be the primary method for the treatment of Bartholin cyst in the future. Wow. We have a 95% cure rate right now on a, and everything I do is what you do, which is all under local anesthesia, mm -hmm. um, which to me is if, if I can stay out of the operating room, it's better for the patients. It's more cost-effective for the patients. It's safer. And I can take my time. I always, you know, my favorite line is when somebody says, Dr. Goslin, you know, I just saw this console and they want to put me under general anesthesia. What do you think? And I always say, look, you know, it's true. You're going to wake up and be done. But the reality is nobody tells you this, but you're paying per hour for a surgery center. So as a surgeon, I have a set amount of time to get my work done. And sometimes I have to go a little faster than I would like, just because I don't want to take up another additional hour and work into the price quote. I, I hate to say it, but that's the business of, of plastic surgery. Where when we do it under local, you and I, we take our time. It's amazing. The patients are watching a movie and we can take two, three hours if we want and do it super safely in a very controlled environment. Anyways, what to you, Red, now that you've discussed amniotic fluid, PRP, laser therapy, surgery, are you doing anything right now that you want to share with us that really may be another cornerstone in our field? Um. The, the biggest thing is the combination of treatments. And my big teaching push is the synergy of energy and biologics. So um, obviously I'm a, a surgeon primarily and most of the cases I do are the labial, labial surgeries and vaginal tightening surgeries uh, under local awake in the OR. I mean, in my surgery suite in my office um, which has been probably the most important contribution I've given to this field is how to do this all awake. When you add everything up uh, and someone asked me, what, what's the biggest thing that you contributed to this field is the, the protocols and techniques for awake in office surgery is what I, I tell them. It's not Thermiva, it's not the Barbie look and all that. It's the safe administration of anesthesia in the office. That's, a, that, that's probably one of the most proud things I have to, to brag about. But um, you're asking what new things uh, have, have I come up with? And it's not really new, but it's a different way of thinking that surgery won't fix everything. Um, Thermiva won't fix everything. CO2 lasers won't fix everything. O-shot won't fix everything. And amniotic fluid won't fix everything. But for the right patient, you get a detailed history. You, you really carefully listen to the patient. The synergy of energy and biologics is what makes the most sense. You use surgery when you need to. You use the energy treatments like you. You did the, let's say you did a, a vaginal tightening surgery, but they still have a leaky bladder. And you can treat that with um, um, lasers or radiofrequency. So you're combining their surgery with um, energy. Now we add that second layer right to the molecular level of the PRP or amniotic fluid. So the combination of those things has been most dramatic. Now, here's a little tease for you. Um, we're working on a uh, new technology, which you know about, because um, I, I trained you with this when you were here, is how to push these molecules underneath the skin. Oh, I use it every day in my practice. Right. I want to hear without, about it. Yeah. Without needles, without injecting. It's yes. Called it's called predictive permeation. That's the new term. The old term was derma electroporation. It's a branded term that we're supposed to be not allowed to use. So we use the, the generic term of predictive permeation. It's a technology of how to open up skin pores, the water channels of the skin and push molecules under it. For example, 
pushing collagen, pushing numbing cream. And you and I use this for, for numbing yes. for surgery. And that's the, that's the new uh, field. It's not new. I've been doing it for over a decade, but uh, we're creating devices, vaginal devices, so that uh, women can have um, the PRP pushed under their skin to help with uh, the aging the aging vagina or the aging vulva. You can push collagen under the skin. And on the labia, you can push things like retin A and vitamin C to help lighten up the skin, make an even tone. So that's my, my current project right now. Um, working, I, I have the device designed already, and um, I can even show it to you, but it's not manufactured yet. And we're, we're um, uh, looking into developing a manufacturing plant. It's a Swiss company uh, that will probably have it internationally and in Europe first before the US, although I designed it here in Laguna Beach. So uh, that's Easy. the project. That's a little tease I have because um, you can't stay still. If you stay still, you die. Totally agree. Ed, I know you're, um, Red, I know you're busy, but I just want to just end my discussion by just saying thank you. Thank you, because really, it, leadership is one thing, but taking risks when you're a leader and knowing when to push the envelope in a field that's really been difficult to crack takes a very special individual. And you have changed literally my life and the way I approach things, the way I think of things. And a lot of times when I'm coming up with new ideas, you're right there on my right shoulder. And I know that I'm not just speaking by myself, but this you have a whole army of gynecologists that you've trained and surgeons that think just like me. And thank you for everything that you do. And my audience, I hope you guys appreciate. Dr. Red Allen saw it's been a pillar in cosmetic gynecology and one that I will always remember. It's been such a pleasure having you on my show and podcast. Thank you. Thank you, David. Those are very kind words. And the audience should know that um, you have given so much effort and thought on how to um, bring knowledge to the, the lay person out there. I know of no better um, outlet or, or, or media um, that this, than this podcast and in introducing concepts and introducing knowledge to the patients out there for their benefit. So I want to thank you for doing that. There's no one better at, at, at that oh, thank than, you. than you are. And so thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to spend a few minutes with you. It's great to catch up. So you'll have to come out here and we'll have to catch up some more. I'll see you soon. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.